Great. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for our April Evening Education Connection here at HMS Connect. Uh, we're so excited to welcome Adam Greenberg and Simi Trachtenberg joining us from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Adam Greenberg is the co-director of the Transition to Adulthood program at CHOP, and Simi Trachtenberg is the director of Community Education and works with the Transition to Adult Care program also at CHOP. So I will hand this over to you both. And again, thank you so much. So we wanted to just start, <clears throat> and because I can't see the chat, maybe you can help by seeing if people raise their hands or whatever. Um, I guess I wanted to find out um, who lives in Pennsylvania. And if you can see how many of, and how many families do we, do we have? So we'll probably, we'll have more come in, but right now we have five families and a couple staff members. And it right. looks like um, many are joining us from Pennsylvania. Okay. Is there anybody from outside of PA? Not in this group right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And um, do we have any, are, are any of the HMS students present in this presentation? I don't believe so. Okay. And then the, the children of the people who are here, what are their ages? I just want to get a, I know that you talked about how what the ages could be, but I guess could we find out? Um, maybe you could see by a raise of hands how many have children 14, 14 and above. Oh, see, I'm actually seeing the answers. We see twins who are, that are 18. Um, So it looks like everybody is 14 or above. We also have a parent of a seven-year-old on. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, um, so I'm gonna we'll continue to use the chat function so that we can um, make sure that we answer your questions and can can really help you with what it all what it all means about transition to adulthood. Um, I'm really sorry we can't do this in person. I remember a long time ago being there working with Nancy Hale um, when she was over at, at HMS school and having a room full of parents and great conversations. So we got this invitation back again. I was really excited to be part of this. So I, I am on the same team that, that Adam is in and I'm gonna let, um, I wonder if we could just hear which staff are there just um, so we have a sense of that too. Do you want to have one person introduce yourselves and then the five families i would be happy to say hello to each of you. Oh, sure. Um, I'll go first. Uh, I'm Julie. <laughs> I'm an SLP and I'm also helping run HMS Connect. Cool. Do you want to just ask people since you can see who's there? <laughs> sure. Ter Teresa will go next and then we'll go to Laura. Okay. I'm uh, Teresa Jardina. I'm a special education teacher and co-director of HMS Connect. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, Laura Boyd, social worker at HMS. Hi, I'm Chris Coy. I'm the uh, vice president of uh, educational programs. Hey, I'm Mary DeLuca. I'm a physical therapist. Okay. Great. And I'm Vicki Van Artsdale and I'm a physical therapy assistant um, that also helps care for a 29 year old adult who has graduated and now works at HMS. Oh, very cool. You'll have to tell me about that in a little bit. Um, cool. And, and that's, that's our yeah. staff. <laughs> okay. um, all right. And um, so we can, when you um, ask questions in the chat, it, it please like let us know if you're a, a parent or staff and what your name is, and maybe we could get to see you as you ask your questions. So um, anyway, I'm a social worker at, at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and have been working 
with um, infants, children, adults, and adults with cerebral palsy for my entire career. Um, and so I'm hoping that we're gonna be able to be helpful um, to tonight. So I'm gonna turn things over to Adam to get us started. Well, thank you again for, for having us. Um, so again, my name is Adam Greenberg. I am a uh, nurse practitioner, adult acute care trained. Um, I've been at shop about nine years now. And really my entire career there have been working with uh, adolescents and young adults, uh, both on the clinical side and also helping to, uh, to transition their care. So, um, so really, um, what we want to get started is just some sort of general tenets about healthcare uh, transition. You may know some of them, um, but really to sort of set the foundation for, for what we're going to talk about for the next 30 minutes or so. Um, so when we talk about transition, we're talking about sort of this uh, very broad, purposeful plant movement of our adolescents to adults with chronic physical and mental conditions from child-centered care to adult-oriented um, health care. And as we know, it's one of the multiple transitions that our young adults see uh, when leaving a medical system. Obviously, it's going to maybe changing schools or jobs. Uh, and as part of that, you know, really what we want to do to the greatest degree possible for our, our patients is move them from a parent directed self care, uh, parent directed to self care, and then from dependence to independence. So those are really sort of the sort of guiding principle around transition. So a lot of people say with our patients, uh, particularly that have sort of grown up in the pediatric system, why transition at all? Uh, and there's really two sort of main reasons that we think of this. One, it's, it's patient-centered, right? We want to think that our young adult patients move to adult providers because they need that age-appropriate care. And of course, that could be as we start, you know, as our young adults start to get older, thinking about uh, chronic disease like diabetes, hypertension, lipid disorders, and also reproductive health, right? And then when we look at it from a system standpoint, you know, for our providers, we really need our adult providers to continue to master the skills of caring for our young adults or adolescents and young adults. And we also need our pediatricians to stay within scope of care. And really at the end of the, at the end of the day, adult bodies need, need adult doctors, right? Um, so in terms of the approach of transition, so there's a, a great organization called Got Transition, which um, maybe about 10 years ago sort of laid out the, what they call the core elements of transition, really for all of us, for all of us institutions that work with pediatric patients to sort of help um, frame how we think about this and how we can put systems in place. And really the, the six elements that we're gonna talk about, sort of the guidelines, which I know a lot of people are curious about. How does CHOP track transition? How can we prepare? How do we actually plan for that transfer of care moving from one system to another? What to expect at that first adult visit? And then what happens after uh, care is transferred? So the guidelines. So this again is something that people are always very curious about. How long can I stay? at CHOP, and again, Simi and I are at CHOP, and so, so these are the, sort of the guidelines at CHOP. If, you're, um, if your son or daughter uh, or your child is at another institution, those, that policy might be a little bit different. Um, so essentially, you know, the guidelines are timing can, can vary by provider and department, but by and large, top of CHOP typically uh, will start to transfer at age 18 and really hopes to transfer care completely by 21. Obviously, it's gonna be a little bit different for each person. Uh, you know, this really some of the factors that we look at are medical stability, if a patient might be involved in clinical trials, um, if they're going away to school, some providers might uh, uh, opt to wait until after they graduate. Um, in terms of how often we can really start talking about it, God Transition actually recommends that you can start having conversations about transition as young as age 14. And really it's just setting the stage that knowing in the next couple of years, you're going to start preparing for it and maybe by 18 or 21, it should be complete. And obviously, really, in all these situations, it's very individual. So you want to ask your, your provider really about the best timing uh, about transfer of care. So how does CHOP, uh, CHOP track transition? Uh, really, we have tools to help our reminder, to help our providers, um, to remind our providers to discuss transition. Uh, all of our pediatricians and subspecialists may transition milestones in their own way. Um, that are based on age and really we'll send you these uh, this slide deck after the presentation uh, so you can look at the gut transition timeline if you're curious sort of what national recommendations are is when you should start talking about different um, different aspects of transitioning care. So really you know how do we start preparing for this? Um, you know it's a, a transition is a big thing right so really everyone involved in, in your uh, your child's care can have a piece of this so it could be the provider. And again, the provider can help set goals for you and your child's knowledge. Uh, you know, encourage your child again to the extent possible to take 
uh, a little bit more responsibility for self-care and self-advocacy. And that's sometimes as simple as even maybe knowing medications or knowing uh, you know, phone numbers for offices. Um, and again, if the patients are able, you know, really encourage them to speak up and spend time alone with the providers, but just to help them find their medical voice, if you will. I mean, and really what I mean by that is just to be able to talk about their disease, maybe their symptoms, their medications. Uh, again, this is a, sort of a muscle that you have to train. Um, obviously, some other concrete things that if the patient's able to is learn how to schedule appointments, um, fill prescriptions. Um, some of these things that we sort of take for granted that, that people might know how to do. Um, and obviously know when to activate an emergency plan and, and what to do. Um, and for parents and, and caregivers here, probably one of the most important aspects of this is really ensuring that the pediatric and providers are aware of the child's abilities. You know, I think sometimes we all just sort of default to talking to the parent. And, and sometimes, you know, we need the families to remind us to say, hey, no, no, talk to my son or daughter. They can answer this question. Right, so something just some some tips for you to take away. Um, just some changes to expect at 18. And again, you might <clears throat> might be aware of some of them, but know that um, at transition, people over 18 are in charge of their own health care. Obviously, we'll talk about some exceptions to that. Um, it's important that you discuss health care needs with family members that have made those decisions in the past to determine how much support they need in the future. Um, the medical team, obviously, when you turn 18, an adult system looks to the patient um, to schedule appointments, manage medications, all the things that we talked about. And obviously, care planning is dependent on a few things, you know, depending on college, vocational training, or, or work. So there's some other really concrete ways to help plan for transition is just keeping healthcare information up to date. And really a great way to do that, again, um, uh, to the extent possible, is have your son or daughter uh, or your child update the health section of um, of their phone, uh, you know, both Apple phones and Androids have a medical ID section that you can put this information in and also having them update the in case of emergency uh, person uh, who is obviously reliable uh, and aware of their care. Um, so how to plan for transfer. So for the next couple of slides, we're really gonna get into sort of the nuts and the bolts of, of what a transfer might look like, but sort of acknowledging again, that it's going to be a little bit different for, for everybody. So, you know, where do we, where to go for adult care? Um, so obviously, you know, depending on what the clinical needs of your child is, um, that's really gonna determine what uh, place might be the most appropriate. And that could be obviously a specialty center um, that might take care of a disease process. You know, like at CHOP, we have a seating clinic. Um, you know, in adult medicine, it might look a little bit different and the services might not all be in the same place. Um, and that's something to think about too. Are there local providers? I know a lot of us, because you know, uh, there are so, so few pediatric hospitals, you know, a lot of people come to Philadelphia for care, but are there local providers that could provide that care for, um, for your child? And then thinking about primary care, you know, one of the things that we try to do when we, when we see patients in our clinic is think about who are the most appropriate people for care? Are there opportunities to consolidate care? Right in pediatrics, we have so many different specialists, and really, you know, a primary care doctor um, that is local that could manage maybe, you know, issues with with GERD or or with asthma instead of having to add additional specialists and specialists. So again, just some considerations of where to go. Um, thinking about sort of records again, trying to be just really concrete here. If the adult facility is on Epic, um, records are available electronically. So, you know, luckily in the past, we had to worry about that a, a lot more frequently, but obviously now um, uh, if they're on Epic, it's not as much of an issue. And obviously what else should we consider? Just uh, considerations for school or work and, and just broadly what um, sort of what your life plans are. And that would really impact where you might wanna get care. Um, so again, planning for transition, some of the, Legal changes at 18, again, in the state of Pennsylvania, at least, um, you know, at 18, you are an adult and you are uh, the presumed decision maker, really, unless there's documentation stating otherwise. Um, you know, we obviously deal with this a lot, but sort of outside the clinical world, um, you know, we sometimes have to educate people about sort of uh, what, what medical um, documents need to be in place to support medical decision making. Um, so, Again, as we sit here, unless um, healthcare representative is, a, a pre if someone has a healthcare representative, power attorney or guardianship is established, uh, the patient calls the shots. Um, and sort of, you know, a couple of the thoughts here are, um, 
uh, when we talk about what happens at 18, it's really who can make the decisions. Uh, it also pertains to sharing medical information so that 18 year old has um, the authority to decide who can see what. Um, and then an advanced directive might be needed. You're probably familiar with, with this, but it's really for, um, uh, you know, when a patient uh, is no longer competent to make a decision, an advanced directive can sort of uh, take over and provide that decision-making um, authority. Um, sort of like to stop here um, for a second, just to see if anyone has questions about legal changes at 18, because um, often there are a lot of questions uh, around this. So, um, <clears throat> I don't know if anybody is typing about that, but um, <clears throat> one of the questions that came in that is related to uh, turning 18 and thinking about finding an adult primary care uh, provider, uh, that one of the club had a question about his 18 year old twins, and that is, um, was he? is the ops memo still in place? And we had that same question, Adam and I, and a couple of other people last week or so. And we did check with um, the Department of Public Welfare to, and it is still in existence. It is still um, something that one could use. So the ops memo, which is, I am not exactly clear what it stands for, but it, it is an operations memo that basically says that um, you can work with your special needs unit um, providers from your Medicaid plans to try to go to a primary care physician. And if that's not a good match for your child or for your family, you can go back to um, the special needs unit provider and ask for a different um, primary care provider. So we, we kind of call it, try it before you buy it. So it's a opportunity to make sure that that whoever your um, child goes to um, for primary care is the right match, that they have an office that's accessible, that they have a doctor and a, and a staff that's really helpful um, with that. And Laura, I know you worked with the special needs units um, in your past life. Did you want to add anything to that? Sure. I think the... Um... The fascinating part about that particular policy is you don't have to switch away from your pediatrician right away. Right. So you can maintain the pediatrician on your insurance card and sort of test out. I, I don't know what the limit is these days. I think it when it started, it was like three providers yes. and you can yeah. have a visit, but then you can sort of still go home to your pediatrician and then try it out so that it's a nice transition period from pediatrics to adult care. And if anyone gives a hard time about it, you should call the special your special needs unit case manager at Medicaid. Right. And then there's also a system even beyond that um, that you could you could get some assistance from the Department of Public Welfare if you're not getting the opportunities to do that. So some of the in my experience, Laura and for a um, for our participants, there are some managed cares that are really on top of that and really helpful to families and others are, are not as helpful. So it's also speaking to your, does everybody have, does everybody know who their special needs unit person is if they have Medicaid in Pennsylvania? And um, so not, uh, so I, um, if you don't know who that is, um, there's a specific group of phone numbers and names attached for um, each one of the managed cares, at least in the Philadelphia area. And I think we could get it for you for the state of Pennsylvania. Those of you who have out of state insurance, um, it's a whole different system. So um, I'm just wondering if, if social work has those names for the special needs yep. units. Perfect. We have the 1-800 number for every special needs unit for Pennsylvania. So if anyone does want to locate who their case manager is, please call, email Christine or I. We can get you that number and get you connected to that person. Um, and I do believe this doesn't, it doesn't go into place until you're at least 18. And it's sort of a grace period between ages 18 and 21 right. to try out adult providers. Yeah. The fact that, you know, maybe maybe you could just send that list when you send out the slides to everybody or post the slides. Sure. 
I'll include that, Julie. Yeah, and the other thing too is on our website, we have a pathway and transition, and we actually have a link to the ops memo itself. So that might be helpful okay. for people to, to reference it again, you know, sort of the lived experiences that we know, like Simi said, there's a lot of variability in people who seem to be aware of it and those who don't. Uh, and just so that you sort of could have that document with you if they were speaking with a, a practice about it. Um, unfortunately, you know, sometimes the issue is the providers, the adult providers are worried that if they're not the capitated provider, they won't get paid, but this allows them to be to be paid for the visit, which is sort of the, uh, the you know, why they get concerned sometimes. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then there's another insurance that has come down the pike um, called Community Health Choices. And I would hope that you would work with your social workers at HMS about whether community health choices is the right insurance for, um, for your child. Um, in some situations, community health choices uh, is the right choice for someone because they may need a lot of in-home nursing care versus um, somebody who might be registered with the Office of Developmental Programs wants to go to a um, a work program after they graduate and wants to have opportunity, more opportunities in the community um, and they, they, where the Office of Developmental Programs offers services. And so the community health choices may not be the right choice for them. So it's, um, that comes down the pike at 18, is either eight, uh, 18 and above. Um, and you should just know that you will be asked to make a choice about that. All right, so shall we move? Yeah, forward? let's go move ahead here. All right, so how does CHOP um, you know, assist with transfers? Um, and, and again, it might be a little bit different at your institution, but this is sort of how we approach it. So we take um, sort of um, a multi sort of pronged approach, right? So um, depending on the complexity of, of the patient um, sort of, uh, and really where the family's at, um, you know, the provider, the specialist might just provide resources to the, the patient and the family. Um, they might have some internal mechanisms to transition some of their patients. So um, some examples that I can think of are, you know, our patients that are, are tech dependent, specifically those that uh, have traits and are vented. Um, they have their own transition, uh, sort of their internal mechanisms. Uh, and some of our, our neuromuscular uh, diseases, particularly um, uh, I believe it's SMA has their own process. So again, it's, it's really part of the conversation to have with your provider about what resources they can provide. And, you know, for the more complex patients, they can be referred to the adult care and transition team, which is Cindy and I. Uh, and really sort of what we do is, you know, for the patients that um, are, are, you know, are 18 and, and, and stable for transfer or stable for, for transition to adult care, um, that are seeing at least two specialists and or have an intellectual or developmental disability, they can be referred to us. And, um, you know, we provide the care coordination. We know that there are a lot of medical providers that patients may see that might be uh, equipment, nursing, uh, community resources. And really we wanna make sure that everything is sort of, uh, we know all of the care that the patient gets uh, so that we can make sure it's all in place uh, in the adult medical system. Um, so to, again, to get in even the weeds even further about what we do, we have a pretty, um, uh, standard way of approaching this. So, you know, once a, a patient is referred to us, and really any provider in the hospital can refer to um, uh, to our our team. Of course, they have to be a patient of CHOP. First thing that we do is we actually reach out to all the providers that the patient has seen in the past two years, um, just to make sure that there's consensus on uh, on on transitioning that patient. Not everyone has to agree that this is the right time, but at least this is the right path forward. And so that when we would bring you in, you and your family into the clinic, we can say to you, we've had this discussion and sort of, this is where everybody is, right? Um, you know, the one thing that we don't want our, our patients and families to feel is sort of stuck in the middle of transition, which is sort of, again, the lived experience is sometimes that. Um, uh, so again, the first thing that we do is, is get consensus um, and that's the communication with care teams. So when you would come into a clinic visit, uh, we have pretty long visits, but we, we go through a lot. Um, so, and really our goal there is to ultimately um, write a medical plan of care, a summary of plan of care that can go with you and goes to your adult providers. You know, years ago when we were starting this program, we asked them what was the most important thing that they had from us, you know, as a transition team. And almost all of them said, if you give us a concise medical summary, then at least I feel I have sort of the, um, that snapshot of what's happening with the patient now. 
uh, to start of, you know, uh, to do that first visit. So again, we summarize clinical issues. We help think about it, the new team and review insurance. We'll go into those in a little bit of detail. Uh, Simi uh, and Natalie, our other social worker review, sort of the uh, psychosocial issues and the community supports. Again, um, registering with community DD services, decision-making support, education, employment, and uh, SSI income. And then after we figure out where, where to go or where we think the best place might, might be, um, we have a nurse coordinator that actually helps coordinate uh, and make some of these appointments. Um, and then follow up, obviously we just, uh, we'll continue to follow uh, with your family until at least the first visit with the adult medical home. And this process uh, in general takes about six to 12 months. Uh, and again, there are a lot of steps in there, but that's also to we just know that it takes sometimes months to get in with a new provider. So it's all part of that, that timeline. I, th I think it's also important to add that um, sometimes we will start with a primary care provider, um, especially if somebody has complicated medical needs so that we might want them to be in a medical care system, which you'll hear some more about. Or it might be that we want to get them set up with a specific they have a specific diagnosis and, and that's really what's leading the way. So it's not unusual for somebody who has seizures, for example, to get uh, referred over to uh, Penn Neurology or to one of the other hospitals and getting that care set, um, set up and settled so that the family can know that one, if there's a problem, um, they can stay at shop until they go to their new um, neurologist and then they would move their care for neurology over. We try to move as much of the care together so that um, the family uh, really gets to meet their adult care providers. Yeah, that's a great point, Simi. You know, I think one of the things we try to say to families that, you know, we're here to support you throughout the process. Your, your, your pediatric team is here to support you throughout the process. And really, you know, really until you step foot with that, that adult provider, um, and sort of, you know, we try to say we know how anxiety producing this is for, for, for patients and their families, and we can't take, can't take all of it away, but at least we can sort of make the, the path as clear as possible, you know, to, to make sure that you're plugged in and you have the softest landing as possible, and we can give the, the warmest handoff to, to adult providers. Um, so I, I think it's also important to add that um, in case there's, I'm, you know, I'm sure there may be families that are on the, um, on the call who are not shop patients. And if that's the case, um, you have, we're just telling you like the model that we use, um, a lot of the pediatric hospitals, including St. Chris and, and DuPont um, have their own way of doing transition to adult care. Uh, but it does, it, it, there are some things that are very similar in terms of helping you find the appropriate adult care provider. And sometimes we share care. So we have some patients where some of their care is at St. Chris and some of their care is at CHOP. And then we work together with um, the, the special needs folks over at, um, at St. Chris so that we're uh, helping the family come together with uh, one, one plan and preferably if the child um, is complicated in one system of care. And that sort of goes to our, our, our next slide here, which is identifying the new team. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of health systems in the Philadelphia area. Um, I know, you know, a lot of us, um, because we work at CHOP and, and, and just as this picture shows, Penn is right next to us. Um, but, you know, their Penn is, may not always be the best option. Uh, and there, you know, we're going to go into sort of the reasons or sort of the thinking behind uh, where we might transfer people to. Right. And so, again, just to give you a sense, too, that there are, are a lot of great systems here. You know, we refer patients to Jeff, to Mainline Health, to Temple, to Einstein, and even, you know, as far as Lehigh Valley and Geisinger, and even Christiana Care for the patients that are coming from Delaware. Um, you know, if, if we sort of work with you as the family to say, do you have preferences? Um, and then sort of think about clinical needs. Um, and, and sort of with that, I'll just sort of go to my next slide um, about where that care might be. And, you know, the first sort of point that I want to make is that, you know, care for CP is not typically centralized in adult systems the way it might be at, at CHOP or another pediatric institution. You know, we have the seating clinic here where you can see multiple providers at the same time. You might see the PMNR doc and you can see PTOT um, or, or the rehab doc and, and the seating clinic. And, 
really in, in most of the systems in Philadelphia, you may not have all of that in one place, right? So it's a matter of sort of finding, um, uh, uh, knowing what's out there, um, and then sort of taking this stepwise approach to, to, uh, uh, to care. So I'm gonna go into these in a little bit more detail, but obviously the first thing we always wanna do is just define what the clinical needs are uh, to think about care consolidation, right? Is there any care that could potentially be uh, sort of streamlined under a primary care doc? Think about, you know, where insurance lets us go. And then sort of this reach out is just about sort of talking with these systems to see if they meet your needs. Um, so when I, when I talk about defining clinical needs, we know our patients with CP potentially have many providers that we're seeing, right? Um, it, again, the, the physical medicine and rehab, PM&R, sometimes known as physiatry. Uh, you know, for patients that might have seizures, they might uh, uh, be seen by an epileptologist, neurologist, uh, pulmonary for our vent and trach dependence, orthopedics, endocrine for bone health, GI, you know, for, for G2 feeds, nutrition, behavioral health and, and dental care, right? So we know there are a lot of pieces that we have to, to address. And then we think about medical therapies too, obviously Botox, Baclofen, uh, whatever your, your child might be on, rehab service and equipment. And sort of that would be our first start is thinking, okay, almost like a checkbox of what these services are, right? And then we think about, okay, again, if any of these, can we, can, can we uh, consolidate any of this care? I particularly think about sort of primary care, again, taking over asthma meds. Um, sometimes they can take over, you know, GT or G-tubes and nutrition, GERD, uh, you know, more the GI issues, and sometimes behavioral health meds. Typically, these issues have been stable. You know, I think a lot of times, you know, we want to do a one-to-one. -one. You know, if they're seeing a GI doc here, they should see a GI doc in adult care. And, you know, of course, you can always see that provider, but if there are ways to really facilitate care and make it, make it easier and obviously still safe, we would want to do that. Um, and then when we think about a PCP, um, you know, we know that just generally speaking, um, you know, uh, adult medical homes aren't as um, uh, available as we'd like them to be. And so, you know, thinking about sometimes who can be the best adult PCPs, um, we work with a lot of med peds trained providers. And that really just means that these docs are trained in both internal medicine and pediatrics so that they have, you know, not only the clinical experience uh, and the clinical training, but also just the, have worked with, with both um, adults and, and pediatric patients. So very comfortable with this population of people. Um, when, again, for thinking about clinical as well, um, the other thing that I would I, uh, want everyone to think about uh, are some special considerations. Um, you know, sort of this lived experience of doing this now for many years is one of the uh, one of the obstacles that we sometimes see is around sedation. We know that sometimes our patients need sedation for you know a number of different um, procedures. Could it be for imaging because they can't tolerate you know MRIs, uh, you know Botox for uh, for contractures, GYN exams. Uh, you know, in a CHOP, it's much more routine to get general anesthesia for, uh, you know, for that. And in adult care, it, it may not be routine, right? And so um, it might be available, but a little bit harder to get and no clear pathway. And really what I mean by that is a CHOP, we can say, okay, we want your son or daughter to have, you know, an MRI for X, and then we can also put a, a consult to sedation. And so they know what to do, right? And it's just not, it's not that streamlined in adult care. So, um, on top of that, they may not have child life services that can offer some of, uh, you know, that the, some of the distraction or whatever um, sort of um, uh, approaches might help. Um, so in those situations, you know, we like to think that, you know, we can't, we can't change everything. So is there ways that we can adjust sort of what we do? And one of the, you know, routines or the, the one of the, um, something that we started mentioning to our patients and families, okay. maybe trying uh, oral uh, medications before they transfer. So where they might've gotten IV um, medicine for anxiety before maybe doing an oral like a Xanax or an Ativan or something like that. So that the first time that they do that isn't in adult care, right? So again, a conversation to have with your providers about trying some of these medications, because we don't want that to, to obviously hold up them being able to get any uh, uh, imaging or procedures or, or visits that they need. Um, so insurance, I think, you know, somebody's already alluded to this, that, you know, every medical system is unique. And again, this is sort of what we've learned in doing this work. Uh, you know, one example that really hit home for us and just how um, 
variable it can be is uh, uh, Penn Primary Care. So Penn Primary Care does not accept Keystone First Medicaid, but all Penn specialties do. Um, and it's something, you know, we've gone up to the state to see if they, they can change that. Um, and really, you know, it's ultimately a business decision between Penn and Keystone First Medicaid. Um, and we bring this up, um, you know, obviously not to create more anxiety, but just sort of know that um, there might be limitations with insurance. And so something to, again, to make sure that when you're thinking about your new, uh, your, where you'd like to go, do they accept your insurance? I um, mean, obviously we just know that commercial insurances may or may not cross state lines and counties uh, and Medicaid's typically do not cross state lines and actually may differ from county to county. Um, so where you might have Keystone First as an option here in Philadelphia County, you know, up in maybe, a, you know, by Lehigh Valley, it may not be an option there, right? So again, it just really helps um, when we're thinking about where to go, one of the, the factors in access. And then, so I know one of the questions came up, you know, about how does care coordination work in, in the adult medical system? And, and again, it's, it's going to be very system dependent. Um, you know, I think we're really fortunate at CHOP that we have a program like ours, uh, the ACT team, and we have care coordination programs and sort of we find it sort of sporadically within the, you know, the adult systems that we work with. So, you know, part of this is sort of reaching out to providers and seeing, can they provide that care coordination? Specifically, what I mean is, will they make referrals to other providers? Will they send orders for PT, OT, things like that, that have typically sat, you know, or a group like us or, um, you know, our other care management teams have done. So in those situations, we'd say, you know, reach out to the, maybe the PM&R doc or the physiatry doc that might be owning sort of the, might be the medical home for the patient with CP. Um, and then uh, if, if they may not be an option, the other option again might be a primary care provider that has a little bit more of a robust um, uh, clinic. And I've just, um, I've listed some examples here that have sort of um, been developed over the past couple of years. And depending on where you live, some of them might be helpful for you. I'm um, sort of Jefferson, um, there's the continuing care program, which is down in the Navy Yard uh, by Dr. Mary Stevens, who's a, just a wonderful physician. And we, we refer a lot of our, our patients with complex medical needs to her. Um, it, up in Geisinger, again, I think most people, I think might be from the Philadelphia area on this call, but there's a comprehensive care clinic up at Geisinger um, and New Jersey and Delaware, although you know, I don't think anyone here is, is from there, but there are some programs popping up, the RISM program. Uh, run by uh, Dr. Jen LeCompte and the Center for Special Healthcare Needs in Delaware run by um, Charmaine Smith-Wright. Um, and then obviously another option in terms of assisting with care coordination could be a case manager um, within the medical special needs unit or the Medicaid special needs unit. Um, any questions there? Again, that's sort of like the, the meat of the, the transfer. Um, let me stop for a few seconds before we get into our last few slides. And then we'll open it up to questions. Yes, Adam, I do have a question. At what age would you recommend um, patients beginning with your program? Great question. So we started at 18 or, or maybe within a few months of 18. Um, by the time a patient uh, um, is referred to us, they should essentially be, be ready to transition. Um, and so sometimes it's a shock to patients because, you know, they see us and we're like, all right, let's talk about your new provider. She's like, I'm not ready yet. Um, so, you know, hopefully there's some discussion before that with the, with their, you know, primary providers, but, but 18 is typically when patients can be referred to us. And so it, it's also possible that um, parents can go to their, their providers at CHOP, their nurse practitioner or their physician, and say, I want to make sure that I have the time to find the right specialist for my child who's complex. And they could ask, you know, you could ask for a referral to the act to or to act as well. Um, and then the, the question then goes back to um, are the which doctors are okay if you move forward, which doctors really want to see you one or two more times. So it's really a way that we work together with, with you as a family and with the physicians that are seeing you. Um, so that's, that's the other piece to it. So you can't, we have had parents who've said, I, I'm really worried. I wanna make sure I do everything in time and that I, I don't just all of a sudden feel like I'm getting kicked out. That's the last thing that we'd want anybody to feel um, that has gotten care at, at CHOP. So we wanna prevent, uh, we want to prevent anything happening too quickly or abruptly. We want to make good plans with that. 
but we've also worked with so many of the different divisions at CHOP that they kind of know how we feel about it and they've learned from us and we've learned from them to even help families start thinking about it early. And a lot, a lot of times uh, physicians in, in our specialty care departments have made it, um, uh, made it an important uh, part of their lives to get to know some adult providers at Penn and at Jeff and uh, so that they can very comfortably say to you as the, the patient family, I know this doctor and he's particularly good at this particular issue that your child has uh, when it's something that, that's kind of esoteric. I know that happens uh, a lot of times in our GI department um, you know, with, with some of those conditions. On the other hand, there may be, um, each, of, each of your children is very individualized and, and certainly has their own set of medical issues. But we also know that to doctors, some things are just, you know, a lot of people have that problem. Um, and so you might not need a special specialist, you know, in terms of what your child needs. So that's another thing that your doctors will talk to you about and that we would talk to you about as well. Yeah, and that's uh, and two things you said, some that I just sort of want to, uh, they're great points, and I want to just add a few more details. So in terms of that that timeline of transition, you know, to Simi's point, if it if you're referred to us at 18, and you would see you see GI and just pulmonary, for example, and if your GI issues are stable, you might transition that. If your pulmonary issues, maybe you've just, you've been hospitalized a few times for, for pneumonia or an acute respiratory issue, that might stay a little bit longer, right? So really, um, so we would try to be very thoughtful about how we move care forward, right? And until again, those issues are stable, we would sort of continue to care for them um, at CHOP. And, and the second part too with adult providers is that, you know, um, in as much as we can, we try to provide, refer to providers that we, we already know. And, and what I mean by that is that we've made referrals to them before. So we know that they're comfortable with, with our patient populations. Um, and then if we don't, you know, uh, depending again on where you live, we may not know a lot of providers in that area, but what we will try to do is do a little research on the providers beforehand. So uh, again, to, um, to make sure one, that the population is, is a population they're comfortable treating and, and um, that they've, they've managed before. I have a, a quick question, if I may. Sure. Um, you know, one of the things that I've become really reliant upon over the last few years is my kids' PCP mm -hmm. is just really good with just, I mean, accepting whatever I send him and saying, you know, I'm going to take care of this form for you, Bob. I'm going to take care of this referral for you. I'm going to make sure that these orders are sent to your daughter's school. Don't worry about it. So uh, he takes care of all these letters of medical necessity for me that, you know, are general in nature for like uh, home health aid care and, and keeping that stuff going and writing scripts to all these different people for um, durable medical goods. And I see that capability and capacity is being really hard to find in the adult world. You know, when, when I call my doctor's office, they don't really give you the time of day half the time. You know, it's like, oh, you go on the portal and do this. Well, my son isn't, isn't going to be able to do that. My daughter can't do it, I don't think. How, how do I replace that administrative capacity that I've become so reliant on? Do you guys have a way of, you know, a means of vetting that kind of uh, part of the, the need that our, our kids have as they become adults? Uh, it's a great question, Bob. And it's actually something we hear, you know, pretty frequently. Um, this is, you know, a concern about sort of who's going to be the medical home in that sense. Um, so, you know, the typically in that situation, if you're not knowing this, you know, specifics, um, you know, but knowing that there are a lot of pieces to this, this is when we might say, you know, the, the continuity care clinic at Jefferson might be a good option for you as opposed to maybe, you know, just a, even a PCP, even if they're in an academic practice, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have the, you know, that sort of administrative support that, that, that you would need just to, you know, make sure that um, the care coordination is done. So in, in that, we would probably refer again to the handful of sort of centers that, that we're, we're familiar with. Um, we know that, you know, sort of that this, we want to see, um, 
more providers like that and more clinics like that for the reasons that you mentioned. But at, at this point, um, through the folks that we, we discussed. Gotcha. All right. So it, uh, my, my, uh, my kids care is then at, at uh, Nemours. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to be meeting with their transition team in oh. a couple months. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I bring that facet of my need to them, they can mm -hmm. help me with that, you think? I do. And I would, and again, I agree. Yeah. And I would say even just, um, you know, even just, it's called the center for special healthcare needs. Um, yeah. You know, even if you just want to jot that down, they have a great website if you wanted to check it out, but really, um, you know, there are complex patients is, is, is who they see. Right. And again, one of the, yeah, one of the doctors who yeah. um, trained at CHOP and, and worked with us over, not in our clinic, but he saw at our clinic, yeah. leads that program at um, in Delaware. So I think that that's at Christiana Hospital. So I, I believe that they are really working closely with Nemours and with, um, uh, you know, and with Christiana to, to look for and try to help with a smooth transition. And the other thing, I just want to put in a plug, just because you're asking us this question, Bob, I know that you're going to ask for what you need for your kids. Um, and, and what we're finding is more and more um, healthcare providers are recognizing how important the voice of the parents are and how, you know, the voices of the parents are and how important the voices uh, of their patients are. And so I think that being clear about what it is that you need, where, what you're gonna need help with, and that is part of the beginning of care and establishing a positive relationship with um, adult care providers to see what, what's the best way for me to make sure that I get the letters of medical necessity that I need. And a, a colleague of mine from years ago, Ruth Landsman, used to write her own letters of medical necessity and, you know, email, email them or gave them, you know, sent them to her doctors and say, okay, this is what I need now. And it really ended up helping that, helping those doctors learn exactly how to, how to get um, for her son Mitchell what he needed. So um, you have a voice in this, in this too. Your doctor at Nemours had to learn how to do that. And um, we're trying to, to teach and collaborate with adult care providers as well and give them helpful hints and I still talk to them when our patients leave us and they call back to say, how do I help this family with, with this or that service? Or, you know, they're asking for things I've never had to do before. So let's think about, you know, how do we, how is it a parent, um, professional partnership to be able to make sure that your children continue to have the best level of care they can. And also, you know, if your um, physician now would be able, you know, would, would your physician now be willing to have a, a one-off conversation with um, the adult PCP so that um, there's some opportunity or there's some way that they exchange email address, you know, email addresses so that if there's a question, they could help each other out with it. I think we're seeing more um, collaboration. It's not 100%, so it's not like we can promise any of that to anyone, but it's beginning It's beginning to happen and it's changed a whole lot since we started down um, this road of doing transition to adulthood and focusing on healthcare. And I'll even say what was sort of, um, was exciting to see a couple months ago, um, Dr. Stevens over at the Jefferson program, received uh, grant funding to train uh, residents uh, to manage, particularly patients with intellectual and developmental disabilities, but sort of along with that, sort of the, the, the milieu of care that goes, goes along. So it's hoping, you know, hoping that the, the next generation of providers coming up yeah. really um, become, not only know what to do, but become great advocates for sort of that, that wraparound support that are needed to, to provide that. And they have, and that program has a wonderful social worker whose name is Karen Roseman, who's, who was with Health Partners at, at one point. And, and I think that, you know, she really, um, really helps families um, to, to get what they need as well. And so we're always advocating for these programs to have comprehensive services. Um, our partners are, you know, people that we work with at, at University of Pennsylvania um, those clinics are not as robust as we would like yet to have that comprehensive approach. So um, just, you know, we're very aware of that. And that, however, there are some children because of their very complex medical conditions need the specialists at, 
at Penn and would need a primary care physician at Penn to be able to communicate, you know, via the electronic medical record, but it's not the same kind of program that we were um, hoping for. And I'm seeing that, Laura, you just said Mary Stevens sees a lot of your folks. Yep. Um, oh, cool. Yep. And Great. she presented, I don't know, Julian Teresa, maybe a year ago or so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, she was first, but um, she sees a lot of our alumni. I mean, if, okay. if your insurance can pay for Mary Stevens, that would be a good option to consider as well. She's terrific. She really is. And you know what I love about her and her office too, is just how thoughtful the design of her office was too. Uh, and being able, you know, just being able to accommodate patients. So just really all around, just a, a wonderful practice. Your ears must be like burning right now. <laughs> so yeah. talking about. And um, we have a, we have open communication with her. Yeah. You know, we say we have this patient, these are the complexities. Do you have room in your, you know, not room with your practice, but you know, can can we collaborate with you? Can we get this person set up? And and um and Karen and I work closely around all of those community resources so that. We get things, everything that we could get in place with the family, um, working with the family before they move to adult care. We, we try to do that. And she carries the ball forward. So, yeah, so just a couple more points here, just, um, you know, before the visit, uh, the obvious stuff, calling, making the appointment, making sure it's written down somewhere. Um, one thing, just ask about parking. I know that might sound silly, but just making sure there's access, you know, if you, if you have a van, that there's a space for it. Um, and give yourself time when you get to that visit. And then really we also, you know, this is sort of the advice we got from our adult provider colleagues is that that first visit with the adult provider, really not to expect uh, too many big changes to happen at that visit, right? It's the, it's the get to know you visit. And sort of after that, they might, you know, start talking about changing medications or treatments. Um, so what happens after CARES transition, you know, as we talked about, um, it, you know, we try to have a thoughtful approach of, from, uh, to this. Um, so we might go with a more stable issue first, uh, or maybe establish care at the medical home first, and really working in collaboration with, with, with you and, and, and your family. Obviously, you know, we want you to work to develop a positive relationship with a new adult provider, acknowledging that, you know, you may have been the same one for the past 18 to 21 years and sort of giving, giving, giving both you and the new provider sort of that time and grace to get to know each other. Um, and, you know, it, hopefully it works out. And if it doesn't, that's okay too, right? Uh, there are other providers that you can, you can always see as well, but really just thinking about that going in that it, it, it might take some time. Um, for our patients, obviously we want them to continue to build their skills. Um, one of the things that we do like to talk about is emergency care. So sort of our uh, approach to this at CHOP is sort of um, once that specialty care has been established with the adult provider, um, you should seek emergency care at that hospital. So what do I mean for that? Let's say we'll just use pulmonary as an example. Uh, if the patient, you know, has been uh, has seen their adult pulmonologist, and uh, it's three months after that first visit, and they're having some acute respiratory issues, should really seek care um, at that the hospital um, associated with um, with that provider. Um, up until that point, though, still okay to come to job. Um, and then, just again, in general, this process takes about six to twelve months. So as we know, change just ahead. What some of the things that we can do really to support, uh, you know, your, your child or even you is just, this is called the transition readiness assessment questionnaire. So just five domains of care. We just ask um, what your, uh, it, your uh, if you know how to do certain um, tasks related to medical care. And if you're willing to learn again, this helps sort of guide whatever uh, education and support we might want to give you with uh, managing your own care, your patient's care. And then these are just some transition resources out there. We talked about that transition, the family toolkit, and actually the Child Neurology Foundation has a really wonderful um, uh, website too on, on some resources out there for uh, supporting transition to adult care. So obviously open any questions and comments and just wanna thank the rest of our team, Dr. Salda, uh, Natalie, who's a traditional social worker with us, Christine Chamberlain, who is our really nurse extraordinaire, uh, and Christian Graham, who uh, is a, uh, uh, a case management support specialists. So thank you. Thank you both so much. Um, before we wrap up, are there any additional questions that haven't been answered?
No. Okay. Well, we, again, we so appreciate uh, you both taking the time to speak to our families. Um, this was just a phenomenal presentation. Uh, and we will, for our HMS families and staff members, uh, the private link to this presentation will go out tomorrow. Um, and Adam and Simi, if you would like a copy, I'd be happy to send that to you as well, um, or Casey. Uh, and yes, uh, thank you again. We really just appreciate your, your time and expertise. Well, thank you for having us. And obviously, if there are more questions, please let us know. We'll be happy to answer them. Yes. Thank you. It's great to be with you thank tonight. You. All right. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you very much. Thank you.